Oftentimes, it, it, it can be very, um, uh, very non-specific uh, symptoms that can uh, uh, creep up on a person. Eighty percent of people who actually are initially diagnosed with pulmonary hypertension essentially have exercise intolerance. That is to say, their exercise ability to exercise uh, is getting worse and worse, um, and they have uh, difficulty breathing, particularly with exertion. Now, the problem with those symptoms are that many different things can actually cause it. So often, what we find is that when th these patients present to their family practice doctor, internal medicine doctor. Uh, anyone else who's not necessarily thinking about that specifically, um, they often are misdiagnosed. And we find many of our patients who come through finally who actually receive a, a correct diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension have gone through multiple years, many years, of not having the right diagnosis, thinking it's anxiety, thinking it's um, uh, something uh, psychiatric uh, that's causing it ultimately. And finally, someone was able to have a mindset or at least an, uh, a suspicion that pulmonary hypertension may be there and then would, they would go ahead and get the uh, correct workup. There are a few uh, maneuvers that we often um, uh, try to do, some of which is, is to try to understand which secondary diseases may actually be uh, possibly linked to this uh, poten potential diagnosis and whether or not that could be, those could be reversed. But the primary way in which we diagnose pulmonary hypertension is through invasive hemodynamics and right heart catheterization. So again, this is another problem in terms of the barrier uh, to getting that type of study done means that you have to come to a center that can actually perform that procedure, and that's in a catheterization lab and oftentimes many physicians and uh, um, hospitals in the community don't have that type of access. Um, and certainly if you're thinking about worldwide, um, if you're not even in a what we call a developed country, the developing world would certainly not have the ability to make that type of diagnosis. So I think that you know we're still behind the eight ball in terms of trying to improve our diagnostic capabilities and hopefully over time we'll be able to uh, um, develop a non-invasive way of trying to make this diagnosis. But for now it really has to to involve a um, uh, invasive catheterization, which essentially is a long hollow tube that goes either from the, the vessels in your groin or in your neck, and you have to snake that long hollow tube from that, the neck all the way into the heart and lungs and essentially measure pressures um, in and around that space. Well, once you make the diagnosis, then we try to determine if there are any other reversible causes for that. So there are, there are some causes of this disease, such as having clots in your lungs, such as having uh, sleep disordered breathing, such as having um, uh, perhaps um, HIV infection. These are just a few of the, the possibilities that if we make that diagnosis, we may be able to treat those secondary diseases and that could have, an, have a benefit on the overall outcome of pulmonary hypertension. Often we don't find those reversible causes, and if that's the case, then we have to make a decision on what type of medication we would like to give or what combination of medications we would like to give. That often will de be determined by how high the pressures are as well as how functionally incapa incapacitated or how severe the disease is for that given person. And we have essentially a gradation or set of gradations that we often use in terms of what type of medications, oral, um, inhaled, or even intravenous that may actually be helpful depending upon those uh, criteria.